Hi, my name is Mark. I was diagnosed with leukemia, CML, when I was 47 years old. Um, we had just moved to a new city uh, and in our efforts to get plugged in with new doctors, um, we went for a routine visit and um, I had something, I had a, some significant weight loss, but had something sort of protruding out from under my ribs that we didn't know what it was. Uh, it turned out to be my spleen, which was full of a really high white count. Um, so after a day of waiting on labs, uh, that news came in and we did a, a CT scan and went straight to find out what to do um, with this new new set of information. Uh, had a diagnosis pretty quickly and started um, with therapy that took care of white cells and everything. And, and as soon as that settled in, jumped straight into TKIs. Before we moved, uh, and in the stress of a new job and, and packing up a house and moving a family that had been in one place for 20 years, I had anxiety and some weight loss and uh, wasn't sleeping well, but I, I sort of attributed all that to uh, everything that was going on. And it wasn't dramatic and um, I was okay with losing a few pounds to start with. I'd always been physically active and I thought maybe my body had just finally gotten to a new point where I could enjoy you know, the fruits of working out. Uh, but I soon got to the point where I couldn't do those things, and I had low energy, um, not sleeping well, had the night sweats, and um, just just all the things that didn't feel right, but, uh, but never really wanted to think a whole lot about it, so I just sort of passed on them all. My first memory of night sweats, I would wake up and my legs would be wet, um, not enough to feel like I was soaking through my clothes or anything, but they would be just uncomfortable, uh, and that was, that was becoming more frequent and also more intense to where I did get to the point where I, I didn't want to wear anything to bed because I would just be sweating through it and the sheets would be wet. And at the same time was getting up a lot at night, frequent urination at night. So I was experiencing it over and over again. Um, I thought that would probably point to prostate cancer um, with, with getting up that many times at night because uh, that gets talked about so much. Uh, in our culture, but it turns out that's not what it was. And when I had that uh, interview with the doctor, uh, with my first doctor, um, she asked what was wrong and I really said, well, there, I don't feel great, but I just had this thing sticking out of my ribs and we don't know what it is. And she didn't either write off because it was so strange. Um, so really there were a lot, of, a lot of symptoms, but I just didn't want to pay attention to them at first. I returned back to my original doctor, general practitioner, um, that I had seen the day before, and she had just taken regular uh, blood samples to send off for a, a CBC. Um, and she said, now I know, because the lab called her in the middle of the night and said, this guy's white count is through the roof, you've gotta get in touch with him. Um, and she said, I know what that is, that's your spleen, it's full of white blood cells. Um, we're still gonna do a, a scan on it to see if that's in fact what it is, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is, which will probably lead you to leukemia. And it, I was by myself, my wife was out of town. Um, so I had to sort through that on my own and figure out how to break the news to my family and to my new coworkers who I was just getting to know. Um, and fortunately, they became a community that has supported me all the way through. But um, at each of those, at that point, uh, that was just with a general practitioner. And then I, when I went to see the oncologist and he confirmed it, um, that news was really hard because I didn't know what CML was. I didn't know what it would, uh, what we had to face. Uh, I didn't know any of the treatment options. So when he started explaining those things to me, it was quite a relief that I could start on, you know, once we get to the stage of taking TKIs, um, that it was a pretty simple approach and we would just see what that would do. Um, and it started off really, really to be promising. Um, so that alleviated a lot of stress that came along at diagnosis. But those moments of shock that last for 12 hours or 18 hours or 24 hours until you can process are um, really scary and disappointing. And, and all the words that you can put in that just shock your system and you're, you, you don't know what to think and you can't predict the future. So of course your mind goes in places that you don't want to be. After I left the doctor, I was fine talking to the doctor. I said, this is something and, and obviously it's treatable and I'll be okay. It's always come at the moments when I talk to the people who care for me, uh, the people in my family, my brothers, when I talk to my coworkers, that's when the emotional part comes of it because I can rationalize and I can listen to the facts. But when, um, when you start to talk about it with people who you know it affects as well, 
that's, uh, that's when all the emotion bubbles up uh, because we're not alone in this because people care for us and support us and you know that it has a huge impact on, on their life. I have two sons and, and this year will be my 25th wedding anniversary and I know that those people are just as wrapped up in this and they don't receive the treatments themselves uh, but those are treatments for them too. So um, knowing that these are things that they'll hear that they can't unhear and it doesn't change um, it doesn't change how they care for you. So um, knowing that it impacts them in tremendous ways, uh, it's hard, that's very difficult. And every time to every instance, everyone's always responded with the same love and care. So when we knew what we were dealing with and the most immediate, um, the most immediate issues were present, we dealt with my spleen, we dealt with the white counts, we dealt with all, this, all the things that weren't leukemia but were symptoms. Um, and those were all just medications that I would take. I had all my medications laid out on the counter every morning. Um, and they did exactly what the doctor said they would do. And soon my spleen would reduce and soon I would not have as many night sweats and, and things were returning back to normal. But, you know, obviously uh, the leukemia was still present. So then we started with TKIs and um, that seemed to be going very well for a while uh, until a blip on the, on the lab results would come back and then we changed to a different TKI. Um, and at that point there were a whole list of second generation medicines that I could take. Um, so there were always other options. Those early conversations with my doctor were, um, I was getting to know someone who was very important to me. Uh, and, and my doctor uh, had all this wealth of information, um, but I didn't know what was important and what wasn't at that moment. So trying to sift through the things that he told me, um, but in every case, he said, this is going to be okay. We can treat this. Um, so at each point, he would tell me, we will take this medication and here's why. And I would ask about other medications, are there other options? And he would say, there are, but this is the one I want to start with because he would say he had the most experience with it. He knew the side effects and he knew what we could expect from it. Um, and he had full confidence in it. So he was really pulling my best interest along when I didn't know what that was. And I appreciated that really um, more than I knew at the, at the moment because I didn't know what to do with anything. Uh, there's a point where you can't do anything but trust because I'm a musician. I'm not a doctor. I don't know what these things are. And I would learn the questions as I went along. Um, but the best thing I could do is be honest and say, I don't understand. Uh, and sometimes the response was, let me explain it a different way. Other times the response was, it's okay. You don't need to understand this. Um, just you'll see how it works and that's okay. Um, so sifting through the information both with medications but also with how I would feel and what I'd be able to do. Uh, I didn't know if I needed to stop work immediately. I didn't know if I was talking about uh, uh, three months that I had to consider or years or but, but being CML I've learned that there's a lot of time uh, and, and there's always seems to be another option down the road so nothing I, I, my doctor and I had a conversation early on. I need to know when it's time to panic. And he said, I will tell you when it's time to panic and that is nowhere on the radar. So knowing that information, um, I could go day to day and week to week, appointment to appointment, and know that I didn't have a crisis in front of me uh, and everything was manageable. And that was the big point where I could finally trust the system and sit back and relax, not, not really relax, but bring a little bit of trust. Yeah. Uh, and that made a huge difference for my mental well-being. When I began Spritzel, it was, I believe it's 100 milligrams once a day. Uh, so it's just wake up in the morning and, and take this medication just like a multivitamin. Um, I had some joint pain um, in some of my larger bones, I think is where uh, most of the leukemia was, whatever that means. Uh, and so in my larger bones, I had more pain there. I remember that my sternum hurt a lot. Uh, and. I had a lot of trouble coming down steps. Um, but I was told that that's sort of normal until things, till the medication starts to work. And, um, and those symptoms went away. Um, they were just side effects of the medication doing what it needed to do. But it was never unbearable. Um, and I, except for needing to take a few days to, to get myself straight, I didn't have to change my routine. Uh, I've only missed a handful of days uh, over two years from, from work or from family, um, I've been able to keep my routine pretty, pretty well uh, the way I'd like it to be. The curveballs that come, uh, you, you get to a point, I've um, 
being 18 months or, or being 18 months into this, I've, uh, it's a long journey. Um, people will tell you that CML is a marathon uh, and not a sprint, and I, I don't run marathons well. Um, so there seems like there is always the potential for something to come. Um, and in my best interest, we've explored five different TKIs. Um, and all of them, I've had great response to all of them as far as the leukemia side. Those numbers have dropped in, in blood and we were really close about a year ago um, to turning zeros. But at the same time, it would have effect, it had effects on my hemoglobin and my platelets and my white count and those tanked and um, about a year ago. So six months into my treatment, uh, I ended up neutropenic and with two different hospital stays. Um, and those were rough because I felt like we weren't making progress, although the leukemia was dropping. Um, so through a third opinion, a doctor said, maybe you just need to stop for a minute and let your bone marrow rejuvenate and sustain your, and we did that for a while. Um, and all my levels returned to normal and I felt great once again, um, was able to do everything I wanted to do. But at the same time, the leukemia numbers went back up um, so then we sort of started over. We did a, a reset, went straight back to Spreisel, which I knew I had great response to. Uh, and that worked really well for a while until BCR, ABL numbers went back up. Um, so then we tried one more um, medication uh, that has sort of a different mechanism, uh, and we've had the same result with that. So now at this point, we're considering what to do if we are chasing our tail over and over again. Uh, we're considering transplant. Is that an option at this point? And those, that news comes, um, it's shocking because it's the thing we've been trying to avoid. Um, but also the reality is that's been a viable option for a long time. And though we didn't want to end up with that because it means I have to pause my life for a period of time um, and it's an inconvenience to us all, uh, but there's a lot of great data that says it's a, it's a way that we can address this issue that I have um, with some certainty. And, uh, and I, if I wrap my brain around that, and if I can, and if I can rely on the same trust that I've talked about with doctors and medical professionals and people who um, this is their business, then I can buy into it and say, yes, this is what we need to do. Um, it's a little bit harder, and it will be harder for my family. Um, but surrounded by a great community that support me personally and a great medical community, I've got full confidence that, uh, that it's gonna work out fine. It's really important to be um, a part of a community. Uh, that's where I've gotten so much support from the people around me. Moving here and three weeks later after I started the job, um, the community that I don't even know came around me and supported me and still supports me. Um, Sometimes it's tempting to, when they ask how I feel, to say I feel fine, because uh, I feel fine. Um, and that's very true, but it's also not the whole story. I've learned the further we've gotten into this that they really do want to know the whole story. And you can take time to tell them, or you can tell them as much as you're comfortable. Um, but the community that upholds us and keeps us going, and at some point will probably keep me going when I'm not going to be able to do it myself. Um, that's really what this journey is. So um, find a community, be a part of it. If it's a faith community, that's wonderful. If, if it's an extended family, that's wonderful. Um, know that those people are experiencing this with you. You're not alone, it affects them. Um, and it's, uh, that's the way we all get through this together.